This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and today we're continuing with my limited set review for Theros Beyond Death. Today we're looking at all the green cards. Tomorrow we'll be looking at the multicolor cards and I'll also have an archetype guide and some MTG Top 10s related to this new format coming out later in the week. In this video, I'm going to talk about the cards in Theros Beyond Death and how good I think they'll be in this new limited format. Limited, of course, means sealed and draft. I give each of these cards a letter grade to sort of sum up my thoughts about the card. If you're curious what those letter grades mean, you should see a guide to that in the description below. All right, let's get started with our first green card. First up, we have Arasta of the Endless Web, who for two generic and two green is a 3-5 legendary enchantment creature spider at rare. It has reach, and whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell, it creates a 1-2 green spider creature token with reach. So a 4-mana 3-5 with reach is pretty darn efficient, and that would probably get at least a C if that's all it was. The question then becomes, how often will you get 1-2 spiders out of this? I think the answer is that getting one is pretty probable, but you shouldn't count on more than that. The fact is that this can block most of the flyers in the set, and your opponent is going to be frustrated with that, and if they want to get it or other creatures off the board, they're going to have to give you a 1-2 spider in most cases. Though there is aura-based removal in this set, most of it won't shut off this ability, so a Rasta's ability to continue to make spiders will be a big problem for your opponent, even if it gets pacified or whatever. In the end, I think a Rasta falls into the lower range of being first pickable. I don't think you want to take her first pick all the time or anything like that, but I do think she's a B-. Next up, we have the Binding of the Titans, which for one generic and a green is an uncommon enchantment saga. The first chapter happens right when you play the card, and in this case it says each player puts the top three cards of their library into their graveyard. The next chapters each happen on your subsequent draw steps. Chapter 2 says exile up to two target cards from graveyards for each creature card exiled. This way you gain one life. And the third chapter says return target creature or land card from your graveyard to your hand. This is kind of like a super slow green Anticipate. In the end, Binding of the Titans is better than Anticipate. This is because it's an enchantment in a set that cares about them, and it is both a way to load up your graveyard and get value out of your graveyard. And both of those things are things you want to be doing some of in this format. It also hates on the opponent's graveyard, but of course it only does so after also helping your opponent by milling some of their cards. But still, it's nice that you can sort of negate that fact by taking away whatever the best cards are that you milled. So overall, I think this is a nice card. You probably never cut the first copy of from a green deck, but certainly not something that's incredible or anything. I think it's just a C. Next up, we have Chainweb Arachnir, which for one green mana is a 1-2 spider at Uncommon. It has reach. When it enters the battlefield, it deals damage equal to its power to target creature with flying an opponent controls, and it can escape. This is a mechanic in this set that lets you pay a mana cost and exile some cards to cast something from your graveyard. In this case, you pay three generic and two green, and you exile four other cards from your graveyard to cast it, and it comes into play with three plus and plus one counters on it when it escapes. I like this. A 1-mana one 1-2 one with Reach is not a great card, but the fact that this can kill X1 Flyers is nice, and there are a few of those in this set. He can also help finish off Flyers who blocked when you were attacking. Note, by the way, that it is not a fight effect, because it just does damage equal to its power. That creature does not do damage to him. That said, if that's all this card was, it would probably just be a sideboard card, but Escape sells me on this being a lot more than that. Paying 5 mana and exiling cards later in the game... To get a 4-5 with Reach, who's now capable of killing the bulk of Flyers in the set, seems like a good deal to me. Neither half of this card will feel that great against people who aren't playing any Flyers, but the fact is you're still getting two bodies out of one card, and that's pretty nice. I do think it falls a little short of being straight up first pickable. Obviously against someone who's playing a lot of Flyers, it will feel like you should have first picked it, but I think we have to account for the fact that sometimes all you're getting out of this is a 1-mana one 1-2 one and a 5-mana 4-5 with Reach, which is pretty nice, but I think that just means it's a C+. Next up, we have Destiny Spinner, which for one generic and a green is a 2-3 enchantment creature human at uncommon. Creatures and enchantment spells you control can't be countered, and it has an activated ability that lets you pay 3 generic and a green to make a land an XX elemental creature with trample and haste until end of turn, where X is the number of enchantments you control. That land is still a land. A 2-mana two 2-3 two, is some nice stats for the investment, and the uncounterable part might actually come up some in this format because as we saw earlier in the week, 
Blue actually has a few playable counter spells, and that will come up occasionally. But the most value, I think, comes out of the stats and the activated ability. Because this creature is also an enchantment, at worst, you can spend 4 mana to turn a land into a 1-1 until end of turn. That's not great, but when it is attached to a card with solid stats like this, that's not bad either. That would probably be like a C+, and obviously those lands can become way bigger in decks with lots of enchantments in play, and that's going to just be something a lot of decks can do in this format. Even if they are just two twos, things look a lot better, and anything above that is awesome. I think you can first pick this frequently. I'm giving it a B. Next up, we have Dryad of the Elysian Grove, which for two generic and a green is a 2-4 enchantment creature nymph at rare. You may play an additional land on each of your turns, and lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. So a 3-mana 2-4 is decently solid on its own. It's probably a C-. It's not a bad baseline. On top of that, though, the Dryad's ability to let you play additional lands and make your lands into every basic land type is pretty nice. The former helps you ramp some, and the latter is amazing fixing. Now, I think people sometimes overrate effects that let you play additional lands in Limited. This is because that ability becomes increasingly pointless pretty quickly. You just will be out of extra lands to play in a hurry, though if your deck has lots of ways to draw cards, it could be better. Don't get me wrong, the ability is nice, but it won't come up as much as people think it will. The fixing this provides is where I'm the most interested. I think that between these decent stats, a little bit of ramp, and amazing fixing, Dryad of the Elysian Grove just barely sneaks into first pickable range. Being able to take fixing early is always nice, and this comes in a pretty solid package. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, I have the first Rowan Games, which for two generic and a green is an enchantment saga at rare. The first chapter makes a 1-1 white human soldier creature token. The second chapter puts three plus one plus one counters and target creature you control. The third chapter says if you control a creature with power four or greater, draw two cards. And the fourth chapter says create a gold token. It doesn't say, but a gold token is an artifact token that you can sacrifice to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. This card is pretty awesome in terms of flavor, meant to represent the Olympics-inspired Eroan games on Theros. The card starts you off with a 1-1, and then each other lore counter is another stage in training and competition. This seems like a pretty good card to me, as it will usually be well worth the three mana you spend on it. Even if you have nothing going on on the board, it helps add to the board for you, then makes the creature big, and can then also draw you two cards with the same creature. Obviously, your creature has to survive to the third chapter to draw that card, assuming you don't have other creatures to help you draw those cards, but most of the time, you'll also have more than just this 1-1 in play, too. The final chapter is probably the least impressive in most cases, but hey, at least it helps you fix and ramp your mana. I think the whole package here is a very strong card, one that I think is in the lower range of being a bomb. It just seems like it will be difficult for this card not to make a big impact on the game, even if it takes a few turns to get going. I think this is an A-. Next up, we have Gift of Strength, which for one generic and a green is a common instant, and it says target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains reach until end of turn. This is a serviceable trick we've seen several times. You normally want to be using tricks offensively, since you can set up bigger and safer blowouts in most cases, because it is less likely your opponent has a bunch of mana up on your turn, and because your opponent can double block. But it doesn't hurt that in a pinch, you can use this to take out a flyer. You'll play this some of the time in your green creature-heavy decks, but it is risky and somewhat situational like all tricks. I'm giving it a C-. Next up, we have Hydra's Growth, which for two generic and a green is an uncommon aura with enchant creature. When it enters the battlefield, you put a plus one plus one counter on the enchanted creature, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you double the number of plus one plus one counters on enchanted creature. There are some pretty good auras in this set, but I don't think this is one of them. It comes with the downside that auras have and doesn't really have a way to mitigate against it, it can lead to card disadvantage from two-for-ones and so forth, and the initial boost it gives you for three mana is not worth that risk. A single plus and plus one counter just isn't enough, and I don't think two is enough either to offset the risk. This means there are two turns where your investment looks pretty ugly, which gives your opponent extra time to get rid of this before you've gotten any real value out of it. Once it has added four counters, you're probably getting there, but that just takes so long. I don't think this is completely unplayable, Mostly because the set is all about enchantments, but I think you cut this far more often than you play it. I'm giving it a D. Next up, we have Hyrax Tower Scout, which for two generic and a green is a 3-3 human scout at common, and when it enters the battlefield, you untap target creature. Three mana 3-3s three do a good job on the vanilla test, and this guy comes with what will normally be only a tiny bit of upside. 
the untapped thing will probably not be relevant at all about half the time and even when it is relevant it will only be marginally so most of the time so i think we just have to give this guy a solid c he's a nice three drop to be curving out with Next up, we have Elysian Karyatid, which for one generic and a green is a 1-1 one, one plant, common. You can tap it to add one mana of any color, and if you control a creature with power four or greater, you can add two mana of any one color instead. Green has a couple of good uncommons for fixing in this set, and when that happens, it means green can do a good job of splashing bombs and removal, and that's always nice. This Karyatid, obviously enough, is one of those creatures that can fix for you. A 2-mana 1-1 one, one is pretty rough on the vanilla test, but I'm willing to take those awful stats when it comes on a creature who can ramp and fix, and if you get big stuff out, it can do it even better. I do think the mediocre stats hold this back from being the B- minus it might be if it were a 1-3 or a 0-3, but it is still a nice card for green, and you don't even really need to take advantage of the 4-power trigger here for it to be worth it. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, we have Inspire Awe, which for three generic and a green is a common instant, and it says prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn, except combat damage that would be dealt by enchanted creatures and enchantment creatures scry two. This is a fog variant, and fogs are almost always bad and limited. They frequently lead to you just going down a card to not accomplish anything, and you don't want to be doing that. Now, this one does some sort of interesting stuff, namely that enchanted creatures and enchantment creatures can get around the damage prevention, and the fact that it scries also helps, but I feel like the enchantment creature, enchanted creature part will be difficult to set up, since even if you have a lot of that going on, your opponents will often have some of it too. And in limited, you really can't count on building a deck entirely made of creatures who can take advantage of this. I think if this were a little bit cheaper mana-wise, I might buy it as a playable fog, but four mana is a ton for a highly situational card like this, even if in a pinch you can use it to scry. I still don't see myself ever playing this, I'm giving it an F. Next up, we have Clothis' Design, which for five generic and a green is an uncommon sorcery, and it says creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is your devotion to green. Will this in-game sometimes? Absolutely. But will it be relevant often enough? Probably not. Six mana is a ton, and then for it to do what you want it to do, you have to have a bunch of green mana symbols on your permanents, and you also need to be going fairly wide. On top of that, unlike similar effects, this does not grant any sort of keyword ability. It just makes stuff big. I think you're expecting at least plus three, plus three to your whole board when you pay six, and there's no guarantee you can do that, even if you are playing a mostly green deck. And while that will happen sometimes for sure, it won't be super easy to make this work. It will frequently rot in your hand for one of the following reasons. It's too expensive, your board isn't wide enough, and your devotion isn't high enough. I'm going to avoid giving it a straight up F because I think it is probably possible that you can end up in some mono green ramp deck where this is reasonable, but 95% of the time you shouldn't be playing this. I'm giving it a D. Next up, we have Loathsome Chimera, who for two generic and a green is a 4-1 Chimera at common. It has escape and you can pay four generic and a green and exile three other cards from your graveyard to cast it from your graveyard. And when it escapes, it comes back with a plus and plus one counter on it. A 3-mana 4-1 is probably usually a D-plus or a C-minus, even in this set where one of the archetypes really focuses on 4 or more power. However, the fact this has escape makes it considerably better than that. You really shouldn't sleep on cards with escape, even those that are kind of underwhelming at first glance. A card that gives you two bodies over the course of a game is just great and limited because it allows you to get two for ones. And yeah, this isn't the best attacker in the world on a lot of boards, but at least the 1-1 Seder tokens in this set can't block, right? The fact remains that it can actually trade pretty well with that high power, and the fact it comes back as a 5-2 is pretty nice, as is the fact that he only requires three cards to escape. I really think this is a common that will overperform. I'm starting it at C+. Next up, it is Mantle of the Wolf, which for three generic and a green is a rare enchantment aura with enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus four, plus four, and when Mantle of the Wolf is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you create two 2-2 two, two green wolf creature tokens. This is my kind of aura, and maybe one of the better ones in the set. Why? Because it helps mitigate against one of the dangerous aspects of auras really well. It keeps a two-for-one from really happening because it gives you two wolf tokens when it goes to the graveyard, and four mana for plus four plus four is a pretty efficient pump, especially for limited, especially when combined with something like this wolf trigger, because you're left with a pretty great card. Your opponent might be able to deal with your huge enchanted creature, but at least you're left with a couple of wolves who can be the targets of new auras, can trade with stuff, or at worst, chump block things. And four mana for two 2-2 two, two wolves is actually a pretty reasonable rate, and you're getting way more than that. 
Keep in mind that if the creature you're trying to put this on is killed in response, you won't be getting those wolves, so it still comes with the downside of a lot of auras, which is playing it into your opponent's untapped mana shouldn't be done a lot of the time, unless your opponent is out of gas or you're desperate. Most of the time, though, finding a window for this won't be too hard, so in the end, this gives you way more than 4 mana worth of value, and I think this aura does enough to be first pickable. I'm giving it a B. Next up, we have Moss Viper, which for 1 green mana is a 1-1 one, one snake at common with Death Touch. 1 mana 1-1 one, one Death Touchers are always solid, especially in more defensive decks. They have the ability to trade with anything, and that means they can often make your opponent stop attacking you, at least as hard as they were before. Like every other variant of this card we've ever seen, this is a C. Next up, we have Mystic Repeal, which for 1 green mana is an uncommon instant, and it says put target enchantment on the bottom of its owner's library. This is kind of nice because it can deal with the gods, but those are mythic, so worrying about that during your draft is probably a waste of time. How good this is really depends on just how many enchantments the average deck in this format has. One mana to get rid of an enchantment is pretty impressive efficiency. Enchantments are plentiful and powerful in this set, so I don't think it's crazy to think people will have 3-5 to five enchantments, and it may be even a little low there. Three targets probably isn't quite enough, but if the reality ends up being closer to five, I think that's probably enough for this to be a C- as a mainboard card and a B- as a sideboard card. It's just so efficient and so nice against someone who's playing a bunch of enchantments. Next up, we have Nessian Boar, which for three generic and two green is a 10-6 boar at rare. All creatures able to block it have to. Whenever Nessian Boar becomes blocked by a creature, that creature's controller draws a card. This is a weird card. 5 mana for a 10-6 is pretty awesome stats-wise, and the lure effect it has added to it means it will just destroy tons of boards. But the downside here is very real, allowing your opponent to draw a card each time they block it. And with the lure effect, they will always be blocking it and drawing cards. The lack of any sort of evasive ability is also kind of annoying. I guess the idea is that the boar will draw all the blockers and the rest of your board gets through and you win. But if you can't pull that off, you're looking at a 5 mana 10-6 that just allowed your opponent to draw a bunch of cards. So as an attacker, you have to pick your spots carefully with it. The good news is, it doesn't have any downsides as a blocker, and a 5 mana 10-6 is no joke as a blocker. So what I'm saying is, you can bide your time with this until it can help you win the game on a single attack, and in the meantime, it can be a huge roadblock for your opponent's ground creatures. Does this make this a good card? No, but I think it's solid filler at least, I'm giving it a C. Next up, we have Nessian Horn Beetle, which for one generic and a green is a 2-2 insect at Uncommon, and it says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control another creature with power 4 or greater, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Nessian Horn Beetle. This is a nice payoff for the red-green 4 or more power deck, as it has a very reasonable floor as a grizzly bears, and a fairly powerful effect that allows it to just keep getting larger. I really like that the ability triggers at the beginning of combat too, because it means that you can play a 4 power creature in your first main phase, and then go to combat and then get this guy his plus and plus 1 counters. This seems like one of the better payoffs for the red-green deck, and I think you can take it with a relatively early pick, even first picking it in some weaker packs, giving it a B-. Next up, we have Nessian Wanderer, which for one generic and a green is a 1-3 uncommon satyr scout. It has Constellation, and in its case, when an enchantment enters the battlefield, you get to look at the top three cards of your library. You can reveal a land from among them and put that card into your hand and put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This type of effect is something people often underrate. I often hear people say, but it can only draw me lands. How's that any good? And I get where people are coming from to some extent. That doesn't seem good at face value. So let me break it down why this sort of thing can be pretty good. In the early game, this can help you hit land drops. That part is probably the most obvious, but that's actually pretty nice. This can enable you to keep some two land hands if you have this in an enchantment you can cast. An effect like this can also help you splash stuff, since it will let you dig for the lands you need for your splash cards, but even triggering this late is good. Even if you have a bunch of mana already, this is because it helps you thin out your library, and after all, you're still drawing a card every time you play an enchantment, and in a limited deck, you'll be hitting a land almost every time you do this. So basically, this is a 2-mana 1-3 that draws you a card every time you play an enchantment. And yes, that card will always be a land, and yes, that's worse than just straight up drawing a card in some ways, but you're still drawing a card. This will grind out some wins just on the strength of that Constellation trigger. I think this is one of the better uncommons in the set, and I would first pick it regularly, giving it a B. Next up, we have Nexus Wardens, which for two generic and a green is a 1-4 Satyr Archer at common. It's got Reach, 
It's got Constellation, and in its case, you gain two life whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control. This seems like a reasonable card for defensive decks, as good blockers with reach and life gain can really bother aggro decks. That said, this set has so many tricks and auras that can make creatures more than large enough to bust through a creature like this, that it might be a little less good than usual. Still, lots of green decks just need guys with reach, so this will make the cut reasonably often, giving it a C-. Next up, we have Nylea, the Keen-Eyed, who for three generic and a green is a 5-6 legendary enchantment creature god at Mythic Rare. It's indestructible. As long as your devotion to green is less than five, she isn't a creature. Creature spells you cast cost one less to cast, and she has an activated ability, where you pay two generic and a green, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, put it into your hand. Otherwise, you may put it into your graveyard. I think this new Nylea looks really good. A 4-man enchantment that makes creatures cheaper and has a useful mana sink ability usually plays pretty nicely, and if that's all it was, just take away the fact that this is a god who can become a creature, it would probably at least be a C on its own. The fact that you can also put the card in the graveyard if it isn't creature is also pretty useful in this format. Like all the gods, Nylea can also become a huge indestructible creature, of course, so she's better than that C, and while that's a big part of the grade for a god, the best ones are the ones who can help you take over a game even if you can't get devotion, and Nylea can do that. I'm giving her an A. She's a bomb. You first pick her every time you see her. Next up, you have Nylea's Forerunner, a 5-mana five 5-3 five, enchantment creature beast at common. It's a Trampler, and other creatures you control also have Trample. A 5-mana five 5-3 five, with Trample is probably a C-, minus, but granting Trample to your whole team is nice. There will regularly be board states where this comes down and it actually impacts the board immediately because giving trample to your guys means your opponent can no longer chump block. I'm not sure you want more than one of these. It does cost five after all and it's not the most amazing five drop, but I think you should be valuing the first one rather highly, especially in a deck with a reasonable number of beefy creatures, giving this a C+. Next up, we have Nylea's Huntmaster, which for three generic and a green is a 4-3 Centaur Shaman at common. And when it enters the battlefield, target creature you control gets plus X, plus zero until end of turn, where X is your devotion to green. This is a quality common. Four mana for a 4-3 is usually playable on its own, but the fact that at worst, this gives plus one, plus zero to something until end of turn on top of that is nice. And like all devotion cards, it has a much higher ceiling than that. The fail case here is a card you would normally play, and the upside here can sometimes have a big impact on the game. That's definitely good enough for at least a C+, and I wouldn't be super shocked if this turns out to be a B-. Next up, we have Nylea's Intervention, which for X generic and 2 green is a rare sorcery. Like all the interventions, it's a modal card that gives you two choices. In this case, you can search your library for up to X land cards, reveal them, put them into your hand, and then shuffle your library. The other option is that Nylea's Intervention deals twice X damage to each creature with flying. This is going to be a spicy card EDH and maybe even in 60 card formats, but I don't love it for limited. It gets its power in constructed formats because it can grab you powerful non-basic lands, but that won't matter in this format 99% of the time. Now the one thing it can do that probably keeps it relevant and limited is that it can help you splash since it grabs you any lands. The nice thing about it is if you draw it late and you have no need for extra lands, it can also do a bunch of damage to flyers, and if you're green, that effect isn't going to bother you as much as it will most opponents. Still, there will be enough times where neither half of this is particularly useful, and I think that holds it back. Its ability to both help you fix and kill flyers does enough that I think you play this most of the time in your green decks, but it is by no means a card you should go after early. It's really just filler. I'm giving it a C. Next up, we have Nyx Herald, which for two generic and a green is a 2-3 enchantment creature centaur shaman at uncommon, and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, target enchanted creature or enchantment creature you control gets plus one plus one and gains trample until end of turn. I like this guy a lot. The ability to give plus one plus one to one of your enchantment or enchanted creatures every turn might not seem like much, but effects like this always play pretty well. This is because you can pump whichever creature you think will most benefit from the boost, which often makes an attack possible, or better than it was before. Keep in mind too that even if you have zero enchantment creatures or auras in your deck other than the Herald, it can still pump itself, effectively making it a 3-4 with Trample on your turn, which is a good deal for 3 mana. The fact that it doesn't need any help to be good, but can be even better if you get enchantment creatures around it, means this is worth considering taking with the first pick sometimes, giving it a B-. Next up, we have Nyx Bloom Ancient, which for four generic and three green is a mythic rare enchantment creature elemental. It's a 5-5, it's got trample, and if you tap a permanent for mana, it produces three times as much of that mana instead. 
Well, this is the first mana tripler in the history of the game, so that's kind of neat. How good is this for limited, though? I don't think that great. Seven mana is a lot, and while tripling your mana might sound sweet, most of the time, if you have seven mana and limited, you have all the mana you need. By the time you cast this, you're not usually going to have much left in your hand to start powering out with all this extra mana. Sure, if you have a bunch of mana sinks, this could make things silly, but I don't think most decks are going to just end up with enough good mana sinks to want to play this. In short, it is just hard to find a place to spend all that mana, even with a mechanic like escape in this set. I suppose if you jam a bunch of card draw into your deck, things might get a little more interesting, but I'm not convinced. Mostly, this is a 7-mana 5-5 Trampler, and that's not good. There might be times that this can work in just the right draft, but it won't be worth it most of the time. I'm going to give it a D. I'm sure it will find much greener pastures in EDH. Next up, we have Nyx Born Colossus, which for 3 generic and 3 green is a 6-7 enchantment creature giant at common. A 6-mana six 6-7 six is a pretty boring creature, but one that you would play in your green decks if you need a fatty. This comes with the additional upside of being an enchantment and contributing 3 to your devotion to green. You still probably cut this a decent chunk of the time, since it's nothing more than a big vanilla creature, but you'll play it enough that I think it's a C-. Next up, it's Omen of the Hunt, which for two generic and a green is a common enchantment with flash. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. You can pay two generic and a green to sacrifice it in Scry 2. The green omen provides both fixing and ramp, both things that are pretty nice, and this is another common that fixes for green, which means green will have an easy time splashing. Like all the omens, this one also scries for you later in the game, and that's not a bad addition to get on a card that already is pretty nice. This will be a solid common for green decks. I'm giving it a C. Next up, we have Ferris Band Brawler, which for four generic and two green is a 4-4 Centaur Warrior at Uncommon, and when it enters the battlefield, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. I'm usually a pretty big fan of these enter the battlefield fight creatures, and they tend to be first pickable in the lower range, but I think they priced this one a little too high for what it gives you for it to be as good as some of its predecessors. Still, a six mana creature who can come down and kill a 3-3 and stay in play is nice, and it means you can get a two for one in a lot of cases, but that mana cost is hard to overlook. I think this is just a C+. Next up, we have Plummet, which for one generic and a green is a common instant, and it says destroy target creature with flying. Plummet is a card we see in basically every set, and it is always the kind of card that you can play in your main deck if you are desperate for playables, as most people will have a few targets for it, so it's a D there. It's a C as a sideboard card, since if your opponent has five or more targets for it, it can be pretty nice to bring in. Next up, we have Relentless Pursuit, which for two generic and a green is a common sorcery. It says, reveal the top four cards of your library. You may put a creature card and or a land card from among them into your hand, put the rest into your graveyard. So, assuming you hit both a land and a creature with this, you end up paying three mana to draw two cards and put two into your graveyard. That's a pretty solid effect. Better than Divination if you can hit both. You won't always hit both, but assuming you have 15 or more creatures and 17 or more lands, your chances of hitting both are pretty good, and the chance of hitting nothing is almost zero. The fact it helps load up the graveyard is great too. On its own, this puts three cards in your graveyard, and that is some good escape fuel. I feel like this is the kind of green common that you basically always want the first copy of, especially if your deck has lots of creatures and cares about the graveyard. It is always important to note, though, that you usually don't want too many of something like this, because not impacting the board immediately can be a problem. Still, I think I value the first copy relatively highly, giving it a C+. Next, we have Renata Called to the Hunt, who for two generic and two green is a star three legendary enchantment creature demigod at Uncommon. Her power is equal to your devotion to green, and each other creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. I think this Renata is at least the second best card in the demigod cycle behind the red one, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that flip. At worst, she is a 4-mana 2-3 that makes your creatures come down with an additional plus 1 plus 1 counter. How good is that? It's not amazing, but certainly something you would usually play and probably at least to see. But the higher your devotion, the higher the power here. So what if this was a 4-mana 3-3 with that ability, which this will be without a huge amount of effort? Then you're probably looking at a B. The creature becoming increasingly efficient does make a big difference. Sometimes it will be a 4-3 and bigger too. So how do we grade this? Well, I think we sort of split the difference. I think that this is worth first picking in weaker packs, which means it's a B-. Next up, we have Return to Nature, which for one generic and a green is a common instant. It has three different options. You can either destroy an artifact, you can destroy an enchantment, or you can exile a card from a graveyard. 
We've seen this a lot before, and it is usually a serviceable sideboard card because it can deal with so many things, but this format might be the best one we've seen it in so far. First off, almost everyone will be running several enchantments. Almost everyone will also have some graveyard shenanigans going on too. There aren't a ton of artifacts in this set, so that part might not come up much, but I think in an ideal world, you want to be destroying enchantments with this since that's a straight up one for one trade. Exiling something with escape can be nice, but it is kind of card disadvantage. I think that's okay though, because at least it can do something if there are no enchantments around. I still think this is better to start in your sideboard, but I think it will make the cut sometimes as a main board card here. I'm giving it a C- in your main 40 and a B- in your sideboard. Next up, we have Satessin Champion, which for two generic and a green, is a 1-3 human warrior at rare, and it has Constellation. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you put a plus and plus one counter on Satessin Champion and draw a card. This guy is really strong, though he does ask you for a little bit of help to be at his best. That said, as we've seen, enchantments will be easy to come by in this format, and even just playing one enchantment after he's in play will make him worth it. Anything more than that, and he turns into a value engine. I think you can take this with a first pick a lot of the time in this format, as I just feel like he won't be hard to build around, giving him a B. Next up, it's Satessin Petitioner, which for one generic and two green is a 2-2 human druid at uncommon, and when it enters the battlefield, you gain life equal to your devotion to green. This seems like kind of a waste of an uncommon slot for me. Don't get me wrong, it isn't a bad card. At a base level, it's a 3-mana 2-2 that gains you 2 life, which would probably be a D. And it has a much higher ceiling than that. Gaining 4 or 5 will happen a decent chunk of the time, and more is possible too. While life gain can sometimes really help you stabilize, I think you were paying a big price for it with a fairly inefficient creature. Again, I don't think it's bad. I think you probably play the first one in most heavy green decks, but for a card with one of the format's premier mechanics at Uncommon, it's pretty mediocre. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Satessin Skirmisher, which for one generic and a green is a 2-1 human warrior at common and it has Constellation. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn. This is nothing special. Like a lot of Constellation creatures, putting an aura on it is fun because of the additional boost it will get that first turn, but there are just so many other places you should want to put auras in this format. This doesn't have evasion of any kind, and it has pretty mediocre body on its own. I know that sounds like I'm super down on this, but I'm not really. I think this is a two-drop you'll run in a lot of green decks, but it isn't going to be a super impactful card by any means at all. I'm giving it a C. Next up, we have Satessin Training, which for one generic and a green is an enchantment aura at common. It enchants a creature you control. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and the enchanted creature gets plus one plus zero and has Trample. I can get behind this aura because it cantrips. Admittedly, two mana for plus one plus zero and trample isn't that impressive, but you'd be surprised how much better a card gets just by saying draw a card on it. By replacing itself, it means that you were avoiding the risk of a two for one, and hey, giving a creature a stats boost and an evasive ability doesn't hurt. Sure, sometimes you'll put this on some underwhelming creature where it doesn't allow you to do anything, but sometimes you also put it on something that can really take advantage. And don't forget, because I haven't said it enough already, enchantments matter in this format. This is a solid common for green, giving it a C. Next up, we have Skola Grove Dancer, which for one generic and a green is a 2-2 Satyr Druid. It's an enchantment creature at common. And whenever a land card is put into your graveyard from anywhere, you gain one life. And you can pay two generic and a green, and it puts the top card of your library into your graveyard. A grizzly bear with upside is always solid and limited, and that's certainly what we're seeing here. The upside here is the ability to gain you a little bit of life over the course of the game, and the ability to help you mill your library, and obviously, those two things can happen together. It isn't like it mills cards super efficiently, but it isn't a bad mana sink to have around when you really need to load up your graveyard for escape. This is a solid two drop, one that can do some useful things even in the late game, though it isn't exactly impressive. I'm giving it a C. Next up, we have Voracious Typhon, which for two generic and two green is a 4-4 snake beast at common. It's got escape. You can pay five generic and two green and exile four other cards from your graveyard to cast it from your graveyard. And when it escapes, it comes back with three plus one plus one counters on it. This is a really good common. A four mana 4-4 four, four is a nice baseline to start at and is at least a C. Then you add the fact that later in the game, you can bring it back with escape as a 7-7 seven, seven, and you have something pretty awesome. Getting two bodies with only one card is always good and limited. And actually this does it at a reasonably efficient rate. I think the two for one potential here is enough for this to be one of green's best commons and a card I'm going to consider first picking sometimes, giving it a B minus. 
Next up, we have Warbriar Blessing, which for one generic and a green is a common enchantment aura with enchant creature you control. When it enters the battlefield, enchanted creature fights up to one target creature you don't control, and the enchanted creature gets plus zero, plus two. So let's break this down. Two mana for a plus zero, plus two aura, not good. That'd probably be an F. Two mana to have a creature fight something, also not so good. Probably a D plus or a C minus. Fight cards are inherently risky, and you need some reason to make the risk worth it. So what happens when you combine the two? Well, you end up with a creature who has better stats for fighting and he gets to keep the bonus. That's pretty nice, especially on an enchantment. Is it premium though? I don't think it is. Usually fight cards that end up being premium also raise the power of a creature and that's pretty important. While raising toughness can help a creature survive a fight a little better, raising power can help a creature kill something bigger when it fights more often. And like all fights, sometimes you're just going to have to two for one yourself to kill something and that hurts. Also, like other fights, it comes with a considerable downside of being dangerous to attempt if your opponent ever has mana up. I think all of that holds Warbriar Blessing outside of being premium removal, but it's solid, and it has the useful enchantment type. I'm giving it a C+. And our last green card is Wolf Willow Haven, which for one generic and a green is an uncommon aura, enchant land. Whenever enchanted land is tapped for mana, its controller adds an additional green. And you can pay four generic and a green and sacrifice it to make a 2-2 green wolf creature token, Activate this ability only during your turn. So this is an enchantment that helps you ramp at two mana, and those tend to be pretty all right, especially when they can bring some additional value. One of the problems with this type of card is that they tend to be pretty mediocre when you draw them late and you have no need for the mana. But Wolf Willow Haven solves that problem by being able to give you a wolf token later in the game. Now, it isn't like it does it super efficiently or anything. It takes a total investment of seven mana to make that happen, but that's way better than a ramp enchantment in a lot of situations. This seems solid to me, giving it a C. That's all the green cards in Theros Beyond Death. Tomorrow we'll wrap up the set review by talking about everything else. The multicolored cards, the artifacts, and the lands. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of this series, don't forget to subscribe. And if you haven't seen the other videos in this series, you should be able to find the playlist in the description below. Thanks for watching.